Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. So based on some comments from Friday, I'm going to run another episode just like that without me on the screen. So let me know below what your preference is. Do you prefer me being on camera or off and ultimately just focusing on the data? Also, let me know if you have an ideal Electrified video length. Usually I just let the content determine the length of the video, but I would be curious what the ideal length would be. First up today, we have this study done by Synapse Energy, basically showing us that electric vehicles are actually driving down electricity rates. This study examined costs and revenues associated with EVs between 2012 and 2021 in three of the top utility service territories in the United States for EV penetration. And their findings? EVs generate more utility revenue than costs and put downward pressure on rates for customers in both cases, and both cases being the first where EV customers were assumed to be on traditional tiered rates and the second analysis they ran was one in which 75% of customers were assumed to be on time of use rates. It's pretty simple. A key reason why revenues from EVs outweigh the costs is that EV customers, especially those on time of use rates, tend to charge during off-peak hours when the costs are lower. This chart sums it up perfectly. We have data for revenue and costs for three different utilities, again, where EV penetration is very high. And you can see across the board, the revenues from EV charging significantly outweigh the costs. Basically, because electric vehicles don't don't really add much in terms of capacity cost to the grid, they actually end up using the grid more efficiently by charging during off-peak hours. The full study will be linked below. Matthias had another great point on the Model Y in November in China. So the Model Y sold over four times the number of BMW X3s during the month of November, which was the second best premium selling SUV in China. And even better, the Model Y in November outsold places two through six for premium SUVs over 300,000 yuan during the month. So yeah, of course, it would be great if Tesla had a more affordable vehicle in the market, especially right now, but it doesn't. So we just have to focus on the markets that it's in. And yes, it continues to dominate even those. From Drive Tesla Canada, after a two year wait, it's finally happened. The Model S and X refresh variants are now being delivered in Europe. You may remember Tesla stopped delivering the SNX to Europe when they shut down production lines to do the refresh and the ramp took a little bit longer than expected, but now finally they are back in the clear. So Tesla's highest margin vehicles are now again being sold in one of the biggest auto markets in the world. No surprise here, but within three days of the Model 3 and Y being available in Thailand, customers have reserved more than 5,000 units saying Tesla has been inundated with reservations and questions since opening the website for reservations on December 7th. Tesla confirmed the first batch of 1500 units will be delivered from February. Also important to note, Tesla has yet to officially join the government's EV subsidy program, but the department did say on Friday they're in talks with Tesla. And as always, new markets are important because we know what happens when there are more butts in seats. Here we have data from Kelly Blue Book for the average transaction price in November of this year. Of course, looking at Tesla first, year over year percent change up 15.2%, which is clearly the highest on this list. So from a consumer standpoint, it's not fun, but from a Tesla investor standpoint, this is great news because it proves they do indeed still have very strong pricing power. Do not let it be lost on you how impressive this is in this interest rate environment, not just for mortgages, but for cars as well. In October, the average interest rate for a new car loan was around 10%, which of course this will vary based on your credit score, but still. And look at this chart from my auto loan, the average loan rate for November of this year. Even with credit above 750, the average new car loan is around 9%. So yes, I would argue that makes this data even more impressive. A lot of you know, Lex Friedman has been recommending AG1 now for a while, and it's where I first saw it. The Institute of Human Anatomy is also on board. There are countless others, but one you will know, Stephen Mark Ryan said this weekend he's been taking it now for two years. And we know he's into health, energy optimization, and longevity. So yeah, just a few anecdotes, but of highly successful educated people all taking AG1. 
Now, yes, they're the sponsor of this video, but just like Steven, I've been taking AG1 now for over a year. I spent over three years in the fitness industry, and I'll tell you firsthand, the supplement industry is mostly garbage, which makes finding the gems of utmost importance. AG1 is, of course, a gem, and we can be confident in that because it's independently certified by NSF on an ongoing basis. AG1 has 75 different probiotics, minerals, and vitamins in every serving. Without key micronutrients, our bodies can't function as intended. And yes, focus on nutrition from real unprocessed food first, but again, even that may not be enough. With every order, AG1 also donates to organizations providing nutritious meals to children in need. Right now, Athletic Greens is offering electrified viewers a one-year supply of vitamin D3K2, which over the weekend on that Davely thread many people were raving about, and five travel packs for free with every new purchase. The link is in the description below. I'm sure most people have seen this leak from Kim Java by now over the weekend, but I would just say we don't really know much about this. Is this in Giga Austin or is this a single piece rear casting or is it two or three? Does this piece of steel right in the middle mean that these seats won't actually fold down, allowing that pass through that many people had been hoping for? One thing that I do feel fairly confident about, some people said, well, maybe these casts were actually made by Idra in Italy, and then they shipped them to Giga Austin where they're just kind of doing the tooling and assembly. Well, as far as I know, Idra can't actually test the Giga Press before sending them to the customer, especially the 9,000 ton one because Tesla has special proprietary injection techniques with a special alloy to actually be able to make these castings properly. Also to any Anyone saying this is white paint, this is most likely just a powder coat that helps to prevent rust. I would also add, as far as we know, the actual 9,000 ton Giga Press machines have not even been delivered to Giga Austin yet. Maybe they're on the premises somewhere, but as far as we know, they haven't yet been set up. So it's not like this cast is from that machine on site at Giga Austin, meaning again, this is most likely just a tooling scenario, and this is most likely just another prototype vehicle, not the actual beginnings of real production. Clearly, I think that should be obvious. Knowing that context, I would be very careful about drawing any conclusions from this one image alone that we really know very little about. Obviously though, it is very exciting and we will continue watching it closely. Where did that come from? Somebody's gonna get fired. Wow. Look at that casting. That's, uh, is there a second picture or is this it? I think that's it, Sandy. Holy mackerel. That's uh what do you think? That's uh that's actually more revolutionary than what I thought. I didn't think they would do that whole back casting. That's gigantic. Is that all one piece? I can't I I have no idea how that's cast. That 9000 tons? I'm going to have to I wonder if that's a single casting or three castings. It seemed to me that I'd, I'd have a hard time casting everything. Anyhow, yeah. Uh, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. I'll stare at that for a little while longer and try and figure out where the breakpoints are. So for now, Sandy says, more revolutionary than he thought. I do want to touch on this only because so many people are talking about it. This survey going around the United States saying that more people are now having a negative perception of Tesla. I just wanted to highlight this company is only surveying 200 people. So I'm not saying they're manipulating this or anything like that. I'm just saying it's a very small sample set. And ultimately, in the end, it's the products that will drive Tesla's future. As long as they continue to execute on the product, there's still a massive addressable market for Tesla to capture, even if Elon does alienate a percentage of it. And we're not going to dive into this here because it's really just a lightning rod, but it really just depends on which side of this spectrum you fall. And of course, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But again, I will say 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, 
Wow, Elon getting a little bit more political for a period of time really didn't have as much impact on Tesla as we once thought because of the noise at the time. That sentiment is highlighted beautifully by this tweet from Matthias. Since January 2021, Tesla's market cap is down over 20%, despite the trailing 12-month EPS increasing over 15 times. In that seven-quarter time frame, Tesla's net income has grown over 12x. Today, Tesla stock PE is around 50 despite growing quarter three profits 103% year over year. Tesla's fundamentals still look better than ever. This chart really tells the whole story. Tesla's market cap in blue and Tesla's earnings per share in green. Clearly a major disconnect. We just have to be patient and ride it out. And what more really is there to say right now other than Tesla has a lower PE than Chipotle? Look, I know it's getting harder and harder to ignore the noise and it's getting louder and louder, but please just do what you can to focus on the fundamentals of the company. I can't tell you when, but at some point they will matter again and all of those who were patient and persevered will be rewarded. Moving on, you probably saw that 40 Tesla mega packs replaced a turbine generator that had been providing energy since the 1950s over in Belgium. But what I did not highlight last week, this was done without any public subsidies. So by demonstrating large scale battery deployment is economically viable, we are proving that we can build a world based on renewable energies coupled with energy storage. This is a massively critical point. If this battery storage is superior from an economic standpoint without any subsidies, then imagine the damage it's going to do when it comes to disrupting with all of the incentives coming with the Inflation Reduction Act. And yes, I know region to region, the economics of battery storage changes, but across the board, we are trending in this direction. From Julian Ibars on LinkedIn, who is a senior staff engineer for the Tesla bot, he said Tesla is still hiring across many disciplines for the bot. And as you can see on the Tesla careers page, if you scroll down searching for Tesla bot, there are indeed plenty of positions open. So this of course is a long-term play, but clearly Tesla is not super worried about the recession and this far off technology, still hiring pretty aggressively. Toyota is set to convene a group of its suppliers in February to lay out its brand new plans for electric vehicles. These changes might include delays to some of the EV development programs that were originally planned for the next three to four years. And you love to see this, the changes would be for successors to Toyota's first two EVs, the BZ4X and the Lexus RZ, that are intended to close the gap with Tesla on cost and performance. And one more for good measure, Toyota's Etinga platform was designed so EVs could be built on Toyota assembly lines with gas and hybrid cars on the same line. But they're now realizing this is a compromise that limits their ability to, to deliver factory floor innovations that Toyota engineers now recognize as key to Tesla's strength. So can't wait to see what this new plan actually looks like. From Drive Tesla Canada, Tesla has also been working to triple the capacity of the rail yard near Giga Austin. If you'd like to track this progress, Brad Sloan has been doing a great job of covering this on YouTube. His account will be linked below. You may remember the news that Tesla was planning to produce 75,000 cars out of Giga Austin in Q1 of 2023. And this fits nicely with that news as this is Tesla setting up the logistics to allow this expected ramp of production again once the Inflation Reduction Act kicks in. Speaking of, the Treasury and the IRS just laid out some new procedures for car makers on how this is all going to work. They dropped this revenue procedure document, basically going over how to enter into a written agreement with the IRS and how these automakers should deal with reporting when it comes to manufacturing these clean vehicles. I will drop this document below if you want to check it out, but hopefully this signals that in the next week or two, we get the final detail for which vehicles will qualify and how this will all work from a consumer standpoint. Yesterday on LinkedIn, we got this update from Arushi Frank, who is the US energy markets policy lead at Tesla, saying they're in Austin to celebrate creating a statewide market design pilot for small distributed energy resources, think VPP, virtual power plant, to provide 
add grid service exports, and they did it in 45 days. They can't wait to get started with bringing the VPP experience to Texas consumers. Simply put, this would unlock a lot more value for buying home batteries, and it would reduce the payback period for these products like the Tesla Powerwall, all while stabilizing the grid in Texas, which over the last few years has definitely been a point of concern. We know earlier this summer, Tesla already did a pilot in Texas to basically prove this blueprint, and they also have one in California that they've actually been operating. But now to be able to go statewide in Texas, this is a really big deal. Hopefully a brand new statewide blueprint for America to adopt. Sadly, we don't have much detail on how this is going to work. How can they actually distribute all of this energy statewide? It seems like a pretty tough logistical challenge, but I'm sure we'll get more information in the weeks to come. Rivian has paused its joint venture plans with Mercedes to make electric vans in Europe, which seems like a good decision because Rivian already has enough on its plate here in the United States. Rivian said it wants to focus on its consumer and existing commercial business as it tries to become cash flow positive in the United States. United States. We have Auto Forecast Solutions reporting that a Ford Bronco electric model will be coming before the end of the decade, so maybe we'll come back to this in a few years. Stellantis said they will indefinitely idle a plant in Illinois, blaming electric vehicle costs, and it seems like they're on the track to totally shut down production at this site. This plant in Illinois employs around 1,300 people where they make the Jeep Grand Cherokee, and again, they said the most impactful challenge is the increasing cost related to the electrification of the auto market. And the UAW shop chairman said the company documents show the Cherokee production being moved to the company's plant in Mexico. He said to him, there's no question about it, their plan is to close the plant. Now look, we knew that a lot of money was going to be shelled out to different companies to help push forward this EV revolution, but now we see $2.5 billion going to Altium LLC and indirectly to GM and South Korean battery maker LG. The US Energy Secretary said the DOE is flooring the accelerator to build the EV supply chain here at home, and that starts with domestic battery manufacturing led by American workers and the unions that support them. Well, you may recall that news item I shared about 30 seconds ago, how the UAW represented the hourly workers at this Illinois plant that may be on the track to being moved to Mexico. But is anyone really surprised? Because we talked about on Friday how this plant just voted to be represented by the UAW, and now a few days later, they're set to get $2.5 billion. Now, if you ask me and you wanna support America, then I would like to see some of this money going to Tesla for 4680 production, not at all like they need it and it's probably best they don't have it because it would just be a talking point for more Tesla bears to point at and criticize the company, but I think you get what I'm saying. So yeah, I definitely have mixed emotions on this one. However, at the end of the day, having more battery production here in North America is an excellent thing and I suppose I'm all for it. Don't forget to check out AG1 linked below to get your freebies and please take a second to let me know below if you prefer me on camera or off and the ideal length of electrified videos. Again, no promises. I'm just taking a survey to keep the data in mind. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.